Hey there, everybody. P. Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of Monday Night Must See TV with the Hudson Valley Squares. As you can see, Mr. Butch Jones is showing off who this episode is all about. I'll have Butch say it. Who are we going to talk about tonight? Cozy fucking Powell. There you go. There yes, you go. sir. It's it's not always good for the host to swear right off the bat, so I figure I'll let you do it. So uh, anyway, yes, we're uh, this is almost like part two of last week. So last week we looked at our top five favorite albums that Ronnie James Dio sang, had sang on during his career. And here we got another legend who worked with Ronnie. It's all about Cozy Powell tonight. So we've each picked our favorite five albums that Cozy played drums on. There's a lot of good ones, uh, some really legendary ones, some not as well known that are really cool too. So uh, let's introduce the boys. Uh, we got Butch Jones, as we just mentioned. We got Chris Canzanari. We got Ryan Scow. And we got Chris Allo. Good evening, gentlemen. Hello. How are you doing? Doing? Drummers today, or a drummer, a drum legend. My favorite drummer of all time. What's his favorite too. drummer of all time? I know the rest of you probably rank, ranks pretty high for you as well. I know it. Yeah, I mean, just a legend that uh, we lost way too soon, and he has played on some fantastic albums. So we've each picked our five favorites. Maybe we'll do some honorable mentions at the end too. So uh, we're going to go. Let's see. We'll have uh, Chris, then Chris, then Ryan, then Butch, then myself. We'll go round and round until we get to our number one. So, uh, Mr. Allo, what do you got for number five? Four, Cozy Powell. Okay. Uh, yeah, this one was kind of tough and kind of easy at the same time. I jotted down five, and then I'm, I'm glad you mentioned honorable mentions because, like, right, like an hour ago, I was like, oh, shit, I totally forgot one. So, um, and I did grab some other ones. Um, but all right, number five, um, yeah, my all-time favorite band, uh, Cozy Powell joined them uh, in the late 80s. Uh, I was able to see Cozy uh, five times in concert, and all five times were with Black Sabbath. And um, my number five on the list is um, 1989's Headless Cross, which was Cozy's first record with Sabbath, and uh, Tony Martin, uh, vocalist Tony Martin's second record uh, with Sabbath. Um, and I, I really like it. I, I think I, I might have liked it a little more back then. I think I'm a little more critical of it now. I mean, Cozy's playing is great. Tony Iommi has some great riffs on it. And Tony Martin's a ph phenomenal singer. Um, I'm just now, I'm a little more critical of the polish uh, on this record. It's a little, it's a little too sheen. You know what I mean? There's the, uh, some of the, some of the, you know, the, the multi-track backing vocals that Tony, Tony Martin did. I, I don't know. I'm a little more my, you know, in my, as an old man, I'm a little more critical of it now. Um, and I always preferred Eternal Idol over any of the other Tony Martin records, because to me that was closer to uh, real Sabbath. But I think this is a this is a really solid record. And, you know, Cozy Powell was a huge part of, of trying to uh, to bring Sabbath back. And, you know, he did he best the best he could. It, it didn't quite work. I mean, it it helped elevate Sabbath from where they were because they were literally in the gutter, but um, it, it only helped, you know, so much. But yeah, that's that's my number five, Headless Cross. It's got that late 80s, like, metal sound. I don't know how else to say it, but it's like the real big boxy it. drum. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. Little, it doesn't kill me, but I know exactly what you mean when you say it's got that polished sound, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's so funny because everybody always talks about, oh, remixing Born Again. And I'm like, you know what? I'll keep... The Muddy Born Again, remix Headless Cross. You know, lose yeah. some of that that 80s stink on it. Make it less a, a White Snake record and make it more a, a Sabbath record. <laughs> For me. I'm with you. I agree cool with you that. to see him five times. I never saw Cozy. Yeah. Before. Oh, no kidding. No. Wow. Where, where were you when he was touring with Sabbath? Uh fresh out of college and drinking up a storm for a bunch of years and not going to concerts. Okay. All right. Yeah, I saw him uh he played in Poughkeepsie. Opening night of the, the Headless Cross tour was in uh, Poughkeepsie, New York. Yeah. Yeah, I was living in Long Island at the time. So I, I don't know. I just, I don't know. What are you going to do? All right. You were busy. Yeah, yeah. All right, the other Chris, what do you got for number five? Okay. Um, I echo everything Chris says about Headless Cross, um, especially the keyboard sound. You know, it's just got that 80s synth kind of thing going on. 
but I went with, for my number five, I went with Tear, the next album after that, which I think they lose a lot of that. Uh, yes, I know, think the production the is, is better on that record. Damn good songs on that album. I yep. mean, it's not a real Sabbath record, but it's a damn good album. I actually thought about it today. I listened to the whole thing like twice today. I'm like, geez, you know, how did I let this slip out, you know? So, and Cozy, you know, is drumming on that. It's got the big, boomy oh, reverb, yeah. you know, and a bunch of great intros. And, you know, he's all over that. I think he, he has a co-production credit on that, as a matter of fact. I'm not sure. I think you're right. But yeah. And then that, that's my favorite Tony Martin album, I think, too. So, Tear Revive. I got two Sabbath picks already. Number five. All right, Ryan. All right. So for this, uh, man, it, this was a little tough. Like my number one was fixed, but the other ones, I just shuffled them around. I could have been throwing darts at the board because they all kind of fell in line. So <clears throat> I'm not going to go with the Sabbath yet. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, MSG One Night at Budokan, uh, one of those classic early 80s live albums. And I think he sounds, it's unfortunate that it's the only thing he ever played on with uh, MSG, but uh it's a fucking monstrous classic live album. Armed and ready. Uh, what else did he do? Well, he's on this record, the, <laughs> MS, the MSG record. Oh, Which that live album was a tour from. Yeah, yeah. Live. I don't have the whole discography. I'll say that. So I'll just I'll shoot your myself. Pick, in your pick is phenomenal. So <laughs> yeah, it's a great pick. I, I almost I almost, I almost put it in Budokan because uh, one night at Budokan is probably my favorite thing MSG did because I it's just. It's one of those iconic early 80s live albums where it's got that great live sound, where it's got a little more fire in the belly than the studio stuff. Even though, you know, Salt Attack, that stuff's great too. So, yeah, that's my number five. This drum sounds fucking great. Uh, just awesome. Great live album. Up there with any of the other classics you could draw from the late 70s, early 80s with, uh, with no, uh, no problem at all. It holds right up. Yeah, good choice. Great album. All right, Butch. Well... <laughs> <laughs> Knowing that uh, I, I've gone on many public records saying that Cozy is my favorite drummer of all time, without a doubt. Um, normally, I call this pulling a pardo, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dub this one pulling a, a, a Butch Jones <laughs> because I can't. I, I, have to, I have to do this. I'm sorry, guys. So I have to do a three-way tie. <laughs> three-way? Holy cow. Because I have right. to get these in. I, I, don't want them, I don't want either one of these to be a, an honorable mention. So well, I was going to say, I just want to pull a keeler and do 12 honorable mentions. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Or 12 well, I got a couple honorable mentions. Yeah. So I'll, I'll do mine quick, though. But I'm, I'm with Chris that Tear is definitely, this is my favorite Tony Martin album as well. And like Chris Allo is saying, it, it has that 80s sheen. That, well, even though this is 1990, it has that sheen. Lots and lots of reverb, you know, very not Sabbath sounding like. It's not dry like a Sabbath record probably should be, but Cozy is tremendous on that. Um, I have to also say, well, I'll do this one. Um, I, I, I have to get this in there. The album Bedlam, that I don't know if any of you guys, P, you probably have it. Yeah, no, I um i don't know yeah there you go Um, all the bedlam stuff on here it's quite good this this bedlam album is the is 1973 it is the birth of of the real cozy powell um cozy plays on those two records with jeff beck that are phenomenal before it and it doesn't sound like cozy the drum tone doesn't sound the same but that bedlam record holds up now from 73, it, it sounds like Cozy. It's got the Cozy drum tone, all his, his cymbal chokes and everything. That that record is the birth of Cozy. Um, but I also have to get a solo record in there. So this is why I have to do it three. So over the top, uh, 1979, Cozy's first solo record. It's got everybody on it. Gary Moore is on it. Clem Clemson's on it. Jack Bruce plays bass on the whole thing. Max Middleton's on it. Bernie Marsden plays on it. So that record is just the song that Gary plays on is called Killer. So it, that record is fucking killer. Um, it, it's it's cozy. So I have to cheat. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. Sorry, not sorry. Those are my tie for <laughs> number five. I couldn't just pick one. I'm sorry. It would have hurt me way too much. All right. Well, since you started it, fucking, I'm going to do it as well. <laughs> 
Yeah. Tie for number me. five for me. Uh, you mentioned Jeff Beck, uh, Rough and Ready. I love this album. And yeah, it's not quite the cozy we know from all the other stuff, but this is really funky cozy and i i like it and i like this album a lot and i think he and jeff work really well together and i love like the, there's a video you can see on youtube uh from i don't know some music show they did uh and they do got the feeling on there and it's just so funny watching cozy and jeff kind of looking at each other and laying down all these funky riffs and rhythms and shit like that but uh really really good album i like this one quite a bit and uh, this was going to be an honorable mention but it'll be i hated leaving it out so it'll be tied for my number five the Phenomenon album, or oh, Phenomenon oh, yeah. album, which has got Cozy know. and Mel Galley, of course, from also from Trapeze and Whitesnake and Glenn Hughes and Don Harry and a bunch of other people. And uh, Mel's, uh, was it Tom Galley, I think is, is his name, his brother. This is really, really good. Just melodic 80s hard rock. Glenn sounds amazing on here. All the vocalists are great on here. Uh, production's really good. Cozy sounds great on it. And uh, so that's those are my two tied for number five. Back to Chris. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, my number four. Oh, yeah. I am pissed because I looked for it everywhere. I couldn't find it. But I did find the shirt. Uh, Michael Schenker Group, uh, MSG. <clears throat> Excuse me. Which is, yep, yeah, there it is. Uh, I have the... I, I was looking so much for it, and I'm like, because I have the, in my head, I'm like, wait, I have that Michael Shanker group, the Chrysalis Years box set. And I, like, looked, for, I was convinced I had it, and then I had to go to Amazon, you know, the website, and look it up. I'm like, yeah, I bought it in 2013. I'm like, what the fuck is it? So, uh, I couldn't find it. I'm blaming Pete, because I probably pulled it for some other show. You pulled uh, it for another show, like, three years ago, and it's somewhere yeah, hidden in your dining it, room. It never made a never made it back to the garage but i i re-listened to how to listen to it again on youtube because i couldn't find my goddamn cd but man just revisiting it what a what a unbelievable record uh i mean i, I was just you know listening to it again just every track other than the the ballad uh what was it called never trust a stranger i thought that song kind of sucked but everything else is a barn burner and i was like literally i was like a squirrel because I was like listening, you know, like really in, listening intently to Cozy's playing. But then I would just all of a sudden, I, all this crazy guitar, I'd be like, oh, my God, listen to this solo. And I would totally forget You're about the supposed to be listening to Cozy. Stop. Listening I know. I'd be like, oh, fuck. I was listening to Shanker again. Fucking but Shanker. man, what a, what a great record. And uh, yeah, that's a that's a five star classic. Yeah, cool. Great choice. Great choice. All right, Cans, back to you. Hey, the next one I picked is. Uh... The first one from that project he was involved with called Force Field, which is not too well known. Yeah, uh, It's not the greatest, but there's some cool <laughs> cover tunes on the first one. And he does do a whole lot of love. And I'm I like, you know, I'm compared to, you know, how, he, how does he play that compared to John Bonham? And it wasn't that great, but I still like the album. <laughs> I still so, think it's fun. So Ken's pick is a record that, eh, it's okay. And it, it kind of sucks, but. Well, you know, we're all going to be repeating a lot of the same picks, you know? I mean, so I thought I'd pick something that nobody's ever heard of, including yeah, me heard, up I've until never heard. earlier this week. I was going to say, Pete, like, you never heard it, really? Uh, no, Force heard Field it. and Phenomena. But these are all, like, yeah. records I remember reading about, you know, years ago in, like, Kerrang! But when you couldn't just look up something yeah. on YouTube, you'd, I'd read about it and be like, oh, cool. If I see this in the store, I'm going to grab it. And of course, I, I would never see it. Yeah, yeah I think Grant Bonnet's on it They too. did four albums. Uh, wow. The fourth one's pretty good. I think the fourth one's good too. Make that my pick. Force Field 4. <laughs> nice. Is that better than just okay? It's it's pretty darn good. <laughs> pretty darn good qualifies. All right. It's super okay. There's the quote. It's pretty darn good. Yeah. I will have to go check those out. So uh, you won't be sorry. You won't be sorry. Which one is Graham Bonin on? You know, I don't remember off the top of my head. Yeah, I'm gonna go look them all up. Yeah, I, I saw them on the list. I was like, oh, I don't. I didn't really spark any interest because I hadn't heard it. So uh, you know what it is to me. To me, honestly, it's you hear who's on it and you're expecting great things, and then it's just like, oh, they just kind of got together and made a record or two. It's it's not. Eh. At least to me, anyway. I and thought he's covered. So. Cool. All right. Something to check out. Ryan, what do you got? 
All right, I'm going to try that one that's been mentioned a couple of times, but I'm going with uh, with Headless Cross. Uh, yeah, I've, I've had a, of all the Black Sabbath arguments I've had over the years, and there have been many, uh, one of the ones is that are the Tony Martin albums really Black Sabbath albums, you know, because sometimes it's just Iomi and Friends and you don't get any of the classic, uh, you know, but I, I don't really care about that. But it's, it's a great heavy metal album, uh, regardless, regardless to the, you know, kind of like, over the top 80s sound cozy sounds great i only sounds great tony sounds great uh <clears throat> i never actually read the interview but apparently or the story but apparently it was the case that tony wrote all these satanic lyrics you know it's like oh, i'm a black sabbath you got to write about satan and uh, i always like you don't have to do that man you can write about whatever the hell you want you don't have to write satanic stuff but it worked out because i think there's not a single weak song on that album the headless cross devil and daughter uh nightwing uh killing the spirit world so I, it's not my favorite Tony Martin album, uh, which we'll get to, but uh, yeah, it's high on the list because there's only a very, there's very, very little that Sabbath did that uh, I don't really care for tremendously. And uh, that album is, you know, it's, it's up there. It's a classic. So I'm going with old headless cross. I should have gotten my, my, uh, you know, my exhibits and shit, but uh, I was lazy. So if you guys got them, hold them up. But yeah, I'm going with headless cross one before. Cool. All right, Butch. See, Chris got all his today. He's making. <clears throat> yeah, that's why I was Usually late. I do, but today I don't know. I just I dropped the ball on it. Next that's week right. I'll bring him. It happens. Back. We'll forgive you. We'll it happens. Forgive. Yeah. Long live rock and roll. Just uh... see to me why I love Cozy so much is that you hear him and me being a guitar player. When I hear Cozy, he makes me want to air drum and play drums, no matter who's playing guitar with him and. and most of my guitar heroes are on <laughs> different things with Cozy, which is really interesting. But um, you hear Cozy, like you just hear, I mean, uh, just like, like say Lady of the Lake, you know, the second song on the record. That is such a Cozy Powell drum fill. You know, just you just hear that. It's just it's just fucking cozy. That's why the, that's where the cozy fucking pal thing comes from. At least for me, it's like you you hear him play you're like goddamn fucking cozy. It's just just his groove and him doing the, the cymbal chokes and just the, I mean just the, that picture on the shirt that embodies everything that cozy Powell is. He's got the the metal wristband, the studded wristband on, and he's playing. He hits super hard. It's just he, he just everything about him is just so fucking cool, and uh, yeah, I mean, long live rock and roll helps to, to, to epitomize what Cozy Powell is without a doubt. And pick any song on that record, man. And uh, so yeah, that's that's easy. That's easy number four. Cool. And just so everybody knows, I I made the executive decision myself that I was only going to put one pick per band on. Yeah, I, I I did the same. Cause I, cause I, I, my initial list, I'm like, oh, Jesus, it's like it's two bands, right? Or whatever. And I was like, ah, I want to get more stuff in here. So uh, I'll save some of the band repeats for my honorable mentions. But uh, <clears throat> my one selection for Sabbath today is also going to be Headless Cross. Oh. I really like this album. Uh, I agree the production is, you know, not wonderful, but I'd love the songs on here. There, there's, to yeah. me, these are some of my favorite songs from the Tony Martin era happens to be on this album. And uh, I mean, man, just uh, when death calls, just crushing the gates of hell, title track, Devil and Daughter. I mean, there's just some great stuff on here. And it's always been my favorite uh, album from the Tony Martin era. And it just so happens to have Mr. Powell on it, which I think makes it even a little bit more special. So uh, that's my pick for number four. Back to Chris. Uh, number three. Um, this was uh, a, a late one, late 90s. And um, I know I talked about it a while ago on some other episode of uh, See you Tranquility. You know, sometimes a record just just grabs you. And this one, uh, I remember looking forward to it because um, I heard Cozy was on it and he was supposed to do the tour. Then, of course, he didn't do the tour. Um, but I went anyway, and it was a, it was a great show. And before this guy got really fucking weird, and this is my favorite album from him. I had him uh, autograph it for me. Uh, Ingve Momstein, uh, Facing the Animal. I love this fucking record. Uh, it's my favorite Ingve record by far. Um, I think it's got a lot of great dynamics. There's some. It's kind of like Odyssey, but there's also some much heavier material than was on Odyssey. Uh, it's my favorite Ingve band because it's got. Uh, Max Levins, who was later in Candlemass, and of course, Cozy on drums, and there's just, 
you know, some great material on here. And it was a shame that uh, Cozy didn't do the tour because so the story was he, he got in some kind of accident and couldn't do the tour. But then when the, the Ingve was on tour, uh, he went, you know, and had unfortunately had his tragic car accident, which had he been on tour with Ingve, um, he would he would have maybe he'd still be alive to this day. Who knows? And I also always wonder, though, well, gee, did 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 Cozy really have that accident to prevent him from doing that tour? Because conveniently, Cozy also had an accident on a horse, which prevented him from finishing work on Dehumanizer. So who knows? But um, either way, I, I still love this record. Whoa. I don't, wait, wait a minute. Back up. Yeah. I, I don't know that. I don't know that story. Yeah. Dehumanizer? Uh, yeah. Cozy, Cozy was, was uh, it, you know, it was Cozy, Tony, uh, Geezer, and Ronnie James Dio. Um, they worked on that record for like a fucking year. And they were slogging it out, and they recorded a bunch of stuff. And it just really wasn't working for whatever reason with Cozy. I, the stories I heard was that there was a lot of friction between Cozy and Ronnie, which is so interesting that a few years later, there was talk of a reunion with them so you know which i had asked ronnie myself and he was like oh yeah we we talked so i don't know they did there is this out i have this it's a four disc uh box set of all the demos that uh, that they worked on including a couple unreleased tracks this one's called uh black sabbath reincarnation um but and then the story was that uh cozy supposedly slipped and fell off a horse and was like oh you know guys i i I, I can't do this. So they quickly brought in Vinny Apice. Vinny and Ronnie, of course, got along great. And then they, they finished up the rest of the record and the rest is history. I mean, that, that band imploded a couple months later, but you know, they were, they were having a lot of difficulties with Cozy and Ronnie. Supposedly, that's what I had heard in the, wow, the same that's, time. I, I had never heard, I had never heard any of that. That's, that's, a, that's yeah. really interesting. And especially like last week, I was telling the, the quick story about meeting Ronnie and, and him saying that, that he told, he, that he was talking to Cozy and they were talking to Blackmore and he told Blackmore he wouldn't do it without Cozy. So, yeah. so if there, that's, that's really interesting. So if there was friction before that, that was 94. So what I thought- uh, 91. So no no I'm missing when I met him. Oh it's, yes yes no you're right for the rainbow thing yes yeah so that's ninety four. So <clears throat> I mean maybe they there... maybe they got over it. I mean, yeah. Wow. But yeah no you're you're right there was a talks of a rainbow thing and yeah. um you know too you know Cozy really was like a almost like a fifty fifty guy with Tony Iommi in Sabbath I mean he really was a huge part of the the resurrection or the mm. you know the attempted resurrection of Sabbath with Headless Cross. So then they, they met up with, with Geezer Butler, and then Geezer had already met up with Ronnie. So that's how the four of them met. You know, four of them got together and started working on Dehumanizer. And Tear uh, was, was, a, was a bomb. Uh, there was no US tour uh, because they were selling so shitty because the Headless Cross tour got canceled in America. They did, you know, I was lucky to see them twice on that tour. And then the Tear tour, the Sabbath was so dead to America, promoters didn't even want them in the states and then they did a european tour and that got canceled after a number of dates so sabbath really was dead in the water so you know tony i only did the right thing by trying to keep cozy on um it didn't work but it really would have been interesting it had it worked because then you would have had sabbath that was literally half a rainbow yeah yeah that's that's sad you know the tier record is so freaking great it just yeah it's a it shame probably, it should have just shouldn't have been called sabbath i think that was the biggest thing you know it could have been and i always say too and i know we talked about it pete on uh doing an episode of you know mistakes as far as like a- albums that had the wrong single or the wrong video you know tears a really good record but i don't like feels good to me why that was the video and it's a terrible video like <laughs> Could have been lawmaker. Some That's any any out. tracks on the rest of that album. Anything it was, else? It was 1990, and they were trying to get MTV money. Yeah, they're trying to go for that ballady type thing, right? Because that's right. What and, but maybe the second video, if you know, come out with something that would grab people's attention more. And it, yeah, it just that was very not Sabbath like. That's no, that was very much not. And yeah, it yeah. didn't. Um, 
Yeah. God, especially 1990. Everybody's into, you know, Slayer and, and everything else, Megadeth. And yeah, so but that's a whole nother episode. Yeah. I never heard that horror story. That's cool. Yeah, maybe yeah. He paid off, maybe he paid off the horse, you know, to kind of get out of it. Yeah, I mean, who knows? That's why. Remember that too. story. I always, I always questioned the Ingve thing. Well, I, I know that was a motocross injury. So, okay, yeah, and maybe that one was legit. Yeah, who knows? Or who knows? Maybe he he just kept talking to Ingve, and he's like, you know what? Fuck this, man! I can't do this. An I mean, can't do let's this be honest. Guy. Ingve doesn't get along oh. with too many people who's going to like share the spotlight with him on that stage. No right? doubt. We were just talking before we went on, we were just talking about it for all of you folks watching tonight who are in the Hudson Valley. Obviously, you're not at the Ingve show in Sugarloaf because he is playing there tonight and apparently yeah. nobody's there. So, yeah. and no one knew about it. Out, like, no one knew about it. I found it an hour ago. Yeah, I'm like, he's oh, doing, he's he's doing several gigs. And he is just so weird now. His, his ego is so inflated that he doesn't have a lead singer anymore. He's got a guy that does some vocals and keyboards, and he's off stage. So Ingve can just you know what, soak though? up the stage by himself. I, I got to tell you, I don't even think it's that, to be honest with you. I, in 2022, I think it's about if I hire somebody, I got to pay him good money. If I go out there and sing my damn song, I can keep that money myself. And that could be it, too. That, that's that could valid. be it, too. That's absolutely true. You know? Yeah. Hey, I ain't taking pain. Jeff Scott Soto. How much does he want? Right. I can do nope. shit. I can sing. <laughs> uh, That's why they, they all just want to come see me anyway, right? So what right. do I need a singer for, right? <laughs> I don't know if anybody else thinks he can sing. I saw a picture of the parking lot there, and it was fucking crickets. I think the crickets. Oh, yeah. Up. I mean, uh, listen, I loved him. I, 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 but the last time I seen him at the Chance, which was probably like four or five years ago, I was like, That's it. I, I'm done. I mean, like, like, no singer on stage. It's just him. There was a drummer and a bass player squished in the back. And, you know, it was a two hour show, but like 90 minutes of it was good fucking guitar solos. I'm like, dude, play a goddamn song. Just fucking play the songs. But nope, it was. Yeah, I'm like, a lot oh of my God. Yeah. And some, some guitar nerds fucking loved it, I'm sure. Yeah. But I'm like, dude, I, you know, I, I want to hear, hear a fucking song, song though. Then that's it. Play a fucking song. You got you got a million records with a with you know ten songs on each record. Fucking play fifteen songs <laughs> and go off the stage. But nope. I was like, oh, forget it. This is fucking terrible. Uh, Ingve being Ingve. Yeah, which I, I'm sure other people are fed up with his multiple things uh, of doing this, and that's why nobody's fucking going anymore. Yeah. I love them too, but I, I don't have any interest in going to see them no. anymore. Like, at no, this point, point, they're all here. We're not at the show. Yeah, so what does that tell you? Yeah, I know, right? All right, Kans, what do you got next? Number three. Uh, what are we on? Number three, right? Um, this is when it started to get really hard. So any one of the, my next three could be number one or two or three or whatever. But um, I'm going to go with slide it in for number three. Um. The drum parts in that are every bit as memorable as the riffs, you know, I mean, a song like Spit It Out doesn't go without that drums backing that up, you know, or Slow and Easy, you know, the whole, you know, that drum tone, that sound, I mean, that's, that's like the sound of 1986 or whenever it came out, 85. 84. uh, 84. 84. Yeah, 84. Yeah, Yeah, 4. But... You know, I, I still remember hearing that for the first time. And I'm just like, what's this? This is great. Oh, that, you know, and I never really thought about drums back then. You know, I'm, I'm the guitar nerd who didn't go to see Yngwie because I'm sick of that shit too. But uh, <laughs> yeah, slide it in. The classic. Cool. Nice. More on that later. Uh, hmm. Ryan, what do you got? All right. Well, <clears throat> I should have taken your advice and gone one album per band, but I didn't do that. So I'm going with a uh, tier of Black Sabbath, which is my favorite thing that uh, Tony Mario with him. Thank you, good man. It's uh, Lawmaker, I think, is the best Tony Martin Black Sabbath song. I can just hear that shit all day. It's on a lot of workout comps I put out. Are made. <laughs> uh, I, I think the whole album's great, though. It's fucking heavy. Tony sounds yep. great. Posey sounds great. Uh, I actually I have to thank uh, Steve Keeler for uh, when I was a lot younger, hanging out at his house having parties. He's the one that originally told, turned me on to Black Sabbath because I only knew the Dio stuff. Uh, I pretty much everything up to Born Again, and I, you know, I was pretty young. And he's like, Nah, you got to check these out. Out, they're fucking great. 
So I bought Tear, and I'm like, yeah, this is fucking great. This is a really good heavy metal album. Uh, and yep, it's remained my favorite Tony Martin one, and uh, I think it's great. So, uh, but like I said, there's not a lot of Black Sabbath I uh, I don't rate highly, but that's definitely on the list. So uh, I'm leaving Forbidden off because that one's kind of, eh. but uh, nope, uh, Tear is awesome. So I'm going with Tear. I'm with you, man. The the only like back to what Chris Allen was saying is 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 it was a sign of the time, or I should say, a sound of the time. And you know, Cozy to me has a really unique identifiable drum tone he does and he, and he didn't have it on any of those sabbath records no so, and I, I mean I, you can tell it's him when you hear him play but it doesn't sound like cozy it so he always had a drum tone it had that i, I wish they had that very boomy 80s sound but he his playing's distinct but the drum yeah. tone is not yeah exactly the, yeah. And it, it's not as overt as it was on headless cross but it's still yeah it's just a sign of the times you know yeah. it's really uh unavoidable so yep. still a great album i would agree i would agree all right butch what do you got for number three well more more from this now there you go slide it in but but people and this is going to cause some controversy because it does every time I, I bring it up it's the american version it's the u.s version people i don't care what anyone says the american version sounds better cozy's drums sound in your face they sound huge the uk version is dry i understand that is what you grow up with if you heard that first and you like that version first because for me over here yeah the, what i heard first was the american version and then go back and hear the other version it's like how does anyone like the uk version better than american version? it's like are you insane not to mention john fucking sykes is on the american version so there's that too but no like uh like Ryan was saying, I'm not Ryan, I'm sorry, like, like Kans was saying, um, seeing those videos of uh, sliding in and just seeing Cozy back there, just Cozy just being fucking cool. I can't, Cozy just fucking cool, man. I goddamn, I love Cozy. He's, it was always just something about him. He had such a presence behind the drums and, and, he, and, he, and he commanded you to pay attention to him, the way, the way he played and oh, the, the videos were just badass too, man. But goddamn, yeah, that his drumming on that. And, and honestly, there's nothing on that record that is really Cozy Powell-ish. There's nothing that's like, oh, my God. But his groove and his little bits and little fills that he does within the White Snake structure just sounds so epic. But it's not like, you know, like I was like, it's not like Gates of Babylon or anything like that. But for what it is but talking about a great drum tone that's a, another i think out of my 18 albums that i picked here i think four of them are produced by martin birch so that's another one that's produced by martin birch and that it's uh just his tone on that man god damn it's, but like i said it's always the the u.s version sorry people the u.s version i like way better than that than a uk version now we're going to see all the controversy in the comments section because we got a lot of folks from the UK watching the show. And if you guys are going to be me, like, you Americans don't know what you're talking about. You know, I love my UK shit, man. I talk about stuff all the time, but goddamn, the drums are on that is it's not even a question. Not to mention, here's another thing not to mention that the, uh, the US version starts with sliding in, which sounds like a, the opener supposed to be. The UK version starts with my favorite song on the album that does not sound like a, an opening track, which is yeah. Gambler. And I love fucking Gambler, yeah. especially on the American version when John Sykes gets some riffs in there. <laughs> but yeah, it's the US version, I'm sorry. Cozy. Yeah. Now, you know, Ryan, you're a little bit too young, but uh, do the rest of you remember the first time you ever heard Slow and Easy on WPDH? And thinking, holy shit, because White Snake were a non-entity here in the states yeah. until that record. I, I was gonna say, I remember seeing the video. Yeah. Before before hearing it on the radio, but yeah. back when MTV yeah. used to actually play rock. Yeah, yeah, true. And the videos with Sykes too, so that was, that was yeah. cool yeah. too. Exactly. Yep. All right. Like I said, more on that in a bit. Uh, my number three, <laughs> I'm gonna go with uh, MSG, the Michael Schenker Group, second album. It's a classic. It's a classic, and I will say it here right now. Gary Barden's best ever vocal performance on any record right here. I know I shit on him a lot in recent times, and I think he deserves it in most cases, but on this album, he sounds amazing. Cozy sounds great on this album. Of course, Shanker's amazing on this album. 
and just great songs on here, right? Attack yeah. of the Mad Axe Man, Ready to Rock, uh, Never Trust a Stranger. I actually, I actually like. Let's Sleep in Dogs Lie is killer. How about Secondary Motion? He That's the song, that dude. Song. That's the song. It's so underrated, right? Oh my God, so good. Uh, I want more. On, on and on. Ugh, crazy. Such a great album. Uh, I personally love the first two. Well, sorry, the first three Michael Shanker group albums because Assault Attack is my favorite, but yeah. I like the first two with Gary and uh, I wish Cozy stay with these guys longer. I mean, that's kind of like the thing here, right? You know, Cozy just popping up in all these bands and not sticking around long enough and made such a mark. And <laughs> wish he would have just stuck around, right? It's just, yeah. I, I was going to talk about that, how, you know, again, you guys might, my guy, but, you know, I, he he had to have been a little difficult on his own <laughs> because like you said it's an album or two and then on to something else and an yeah. album or two and then on this and he literally did play with like a lot of my favorite guitar players of all time but yeah. he's only done a record or two with them uh, he, he was with gary moore on after the war and he kills on that what he plays on and simon phillips is on it too yeah. but i i remember reading and that was 89 and i remember reading then that you know that he he had left and wasn't doing a tour because, as Cozy said, Gary Gary was trying to tell me what to play. It's like nobody's gonna tell me what to play, <laughs> and I'm thinking it's like, well, you are fucking Cozy Pell. <laughs> that's just kind of true, but well, that's the issue. Know, Most of the guys that he decided to work for or work with were really strong-willed guys, right? I mean, look at Beck and Blackmore and Coverdale and Shanker and Iomi and Gary. I mean, this this is. Bounstein. Uh, Mountain, <laughs> right? So he's working with these guys, and he is that same type of guy. Yeah. So I think one of the reasons why Cozy Powell was never like the more, you know, more more famous of a drummer to like the masses, right? Like a like a John Bonham or a Ringo Starr or whoever, right? The drummers that everybody knows because they played in us in the same band for so many years. Cozy was just like. Boom, 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 boom. And it's like, you can't keep up with them unless you're people. Never got a chance, yeah, you're like right. Like us, right? So, yeah, it's I, it's really a shame because I think, you know, he should be looked back on, like, f from everybody uh, as one of the greatest drummers that ever lived. But, you know, like I said, people like us know it. But, right. you know, you walk up, you walk up to 10 people in the street and you go, do you know who Cozy Powell is? They're all going to look at you and like, wasn't he the guy who was the uh, press secretary or, you know, whatever. <laughs> they, they just, they don't know, right? They're like, so... And it's a shame. It's a really it shame. A shame. But I think because he was kind of like almost like this mercenary for hire for his whole career, you know, he didn't stay anywhere for too, too long. Anyway, yep. uh, I digress. So uh, back to Chris, number two. Okay, number two. Yeah, this is a tough one. Uh, but uh, I went with Rainbow Rising. Uh, I was definitely obviously doing a Rainbow record. I didn't want to, uh, you know, didn't want to not, I didn't want to do all three of the Rainbow records. But um, yeah, I, I did Rainbow Rising. I know we talked about it quite a bit on the last one. Wow. I mean, it's I don't know what, what to say that hasn't been said, but it's uh, it's a barn burner, all right. Um, yeah, one of the greatest records ever, and uh, yeah, I think I think Co you know Cozy's playing. I think is great. You know, for my number one, I was going more with not so much Cozy's playing, but you know, which album do I listen to more? And the, the, my number one, I think, just currently, I just listen to it more than a little more, little more than Rainbow Rising. So that's why I put it at my number two. Cool. All right. Mr. Cantonary, what do you got? Okay, with number two, I'm going with MSG. Um, we don't have much else to say. I think that the first three tracks, you know, Ready to Rock and Attack of the Max, Mad Axe Man, and on and on, it's just like one, two, three. It's a great, one of my favorite, you know, opening one, two, threes on an album. And not to say that the rest of it isn't fucking awesome, but I'm like UP. I enjoy those first two albums. I think Gary Barden was great on both of them, you know, so MSG could have been number one, two or three. Like I said, you know, I'm having trouble with the top three here, but it's number two today, but. Cool. And since we're talking about this, how come Gary Barden didn't get a gig either with Tony Iommi or Richie Blackmore? <laughs> I mean, all these guys are so incestuous. Why didn't one of them pick him up? Give that guy a job. I got yeah. an idea why. <laughs> so does Pete. <laughs> it uh, really wasn't that good. <laughs> well, I mean, the records were good. He's yeah, great he's great on the, on the records. records. <laughs> yeah. 
I don't know. I I love Gary. I think he's a great front man because he's up. He just looks the part. But man, every time I've ever seen him live, he sucks. <laughs> and, you know, and you know, it's I think he like, you know, Ryan talked about the Budokan album. I mean, he, he sounds pretty good on that. Yeah. He's but, not and, bad on that. Yeah. And, and, you know, he he's one of these weird guys because like what else has he really done outside of Shanker? Like he he's not out there touring year after year after year doing oh, hundreds of gigs, right? blowing his voice out, right? He's not like, you know, a guy like who obviously has a lot of mileage on them, like, a, you know, a Bonnet or a Coverdale or Coverdale, a Dillon, yeah. right? I mean, so what's his excuse? Yeah. Well, that's why I was wondering, what, what else? I mean, he's good on Budokan, but like no one's listening to that album for him. You know, he's not like the fucking flag, you know, the tent pole in the center of that album. But, uh, but the he's point, Ryan, is he's, he's good on it, but he's like good. he didn't do anything else for years. And then he comes well, back and he's like, what happened to this guy? It's like, you know what? I just went like a million bands in between and touring, you know, 10 months out of the year. Now he's just sitting at home and I don't know. Really weird. I just got hip to something through my butcher shop page, the group there, which I did not know about. And I was, I was, I was stupefied that I didn't know about this at all. That someone asked me kind of like nonchalantly, he's like, oh, you've heard the, the Gary Barden singing for Gary Moore on Quarters of Power stuff, right? I'm like, what? <laughs> so what are you talking about? And I listened, he sent me, the, you know, it's on YouTube, there's a demo of Gary Barden singing Gary Moore's Don't Take Me For A Loser. And it's in the studio, and you listen to it, and, and we're all very glad that Gary Moore sang it. <laughs> it's not bad. I, I, I mean, I'm saying it being funny, but it, it doesn't suck. But Gary Moore was way better. So to me, I've always felt like Pete was saying that there's got to be a reason that you did those, you know, the first two, and then you came back and did another one with Shanker, and then no one heard from you for, you know, 25 years until Shanker. Well, Shanker called him up again. He, he did it again. So uh, he, he must not have, you know, other people must have thought he wasn't all that great either. <laughs> but yeah, the, well, I mean, the let's Gary be Moore. honest. Gary was a, Gary Moore was a better singer than Gary Barton. Yeah, okay. And I, you have to wonder because. Maybe Gary, because Gary didn't do a ton of vocals on his previous stuff. So maybe he figured, well, let me bring in, you know, someone else. Yeah. And see how it goes. Because obviously he knew he worked with Schenker. And then he, during the recordings, he's probably like, yeah, I could probably do this better. And obviously he did. So, yeah. and you all, you know, as far as Barden's concerned, if the shit didn't happen with Graham Bonnet, would right. Schenker have ever That's called him again? That's a great point. Yeah. Well, he might have been living in obscurity the rest of his career, right? So, yep. I don't know. But yeah, check out, if you guys haven't heard it, check out the, the YouTube. You can, it's, it's very easy to find. And you can hear how Gary Moore is so much more soulful than Gary Barton. It, it didn't work. Yeah. I can it's totally interesting. That. All right, cool. I'll have to check it out. All right, where were we? Ryan, right? All right, well, it's funny you guys mentioned, uh, just detour a little bit here about him not doing anything because, like, Two weeks ago, I just saw Candlemass in Texas. And Candlemass about a million singers, and obviously Messiah is probably the most famous one. But on the first album, they had a guy called uh, Johan uh, Lanquist on uh, Epicus Dumicus. Yep. He sang on that album, and he didn't do shit for like four. Or that was eighty six. He didn't do anything pretty much after that ever. Uh, he just dropped out of music, and he came back to Candlemass recently. So we, I saw him, and he was the singer, and he sounded fucking phenomenal. He sounded great. He sang all those Epicus songs great. He sang Messiah stuff on like Nightfall, great. And uh, that's the thing where this guy takes all those years off, his voice doesn't suffer for it, comes back and belts it out of the fucking park. So some guys can do it, you know, and that's uh, obviously case by case basis. But uh, all right. So, uh, well, wait, I got to ask, did they do Bewitched? They did. How did he sound with that? It sounded awesome. Did he sounded, really? Yeah, he sounded good. Uh, he, he, he doesn't sound like Messiah, but he, he did the songs in his way. And well, he's got his own style, which I yeah. really dig. I mean, that last album they did with him is great. Yeah, it's great. It was great. Great. The only thing they didn't do was uh, At the Gallows End from Nightfall. I would have liked to hear that. That's a that's a classic track. But, I mean, they yeah. played a lot from Nightfall. They played a lot from Epicus. Solid. They, they opened with uh, Well of Souls from Nightfall, and they closed with oh. Solitude from, uh, from uh, well the first Souls album. Was great. Nice. The audience was eating it up with a fucking soup ladle so it was good but uh all right so uh i'm gonna i don't want to philosophize here for, for, for the fucking can't speak here uh 
So I, to me, to me, one of the big differences between uh, or one of the big things when when rock was kind of transitioning into metal at the end of the seventies, early eighties, one of like the big things about that was these drummers were coming along and they were transitioning from playing like more of a laid back bluesy seventies style to like just fucking beating the fucking tar out of their drums. So you obviously have Filthy from Motorhead. He's a big one. You have Clyde Burr from Maiden who played with like fucking battle axes, uh, Les Binks. But I, the first one and probably the biggest one was Cozy uh, with Rainbow. So I'm going with the second Rainbow album, Long Live Rock and Roll, because this album's got songs like Kill the King, which is pretty much straight up, you know, speed thrash metal from 78. And he beats the fucking tar out of those drums uh, on that song. But even like Long Live Rock and Roll comes in with the drums on like a thunderstorm. So to me, he was probably the, the, the lead of these different guys coming in. They were like, we're not going to play in this more laid back 70s style. Not that some of those seventies guys didn't like play hard and heavy, you know, but oh, God. it's a different thing. It's a different, it's like a different sound. It's way more forceful. It's like the really lean, you know, it just, I don't know, has much more attack, much more aggression to it. And he, 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 yeah. And he, his style was like paramount in that. And these other guys obviously were all great, but he did it first and arguably did it best. So, uh, well, yeah, you, know, I, you know what it was? The drums became to the came to the forefront. They did. They weren't. They, they led, weren't just yeah. sitting back. Now it was part of the equation. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they kind of like lead the attack along with the riffs because the guitars became way more like you know in the early seventies there wasn't really songs like Kill the King, which is like it's just like mm. you know it's like a train coming off the rails. I mean, you had Highway Star and stuff, which was getting there, but by the end right. of the seventies it was a different thing. So uh, yeah, filthy obviously on songs like Overkill, which is beating the fucking tar out of the kick drums, but uh. Yeah, Cozy to me did it first and he did it best. So I'm going with Long Live Rock and Roll from 1978. Great fucking out. But that was yeah. actually the third Rainbow record. It is, but it's the second one with the uh, second one with Cozy, yeah. Second one with Cozy, yeah. That's what I meant to say, because when Cozy came on board, he introduced that style. And I the first oh, one's yeah. great, but it's not really the same from a drum perspective of no. that, like really like gonna beat the fucking drums into the stage, you know, which, which he uh, really did a big he brought around. Yeah, that's some good points you made about uh, some of these bands moving into the 80s and, you know, their drummers just kind of you know, kicking it up a notch, you know? Yeah, because like even like Filthy, he wasn't like this, like he wasn't like, you know, uh, playing for like prog rock bands, but he beat the fucking tar out of those drums and it worked. It was a different thing that you didn't really see a lot of in like rock bands going <laughs> earlier into the 70s, you know? He just comes in and just starts beating the fucking tar out of them and it's great. It worked, you know? Brought around thrash, speed metal, all this other stuff where... Uh, I'm a somehow, despite all that, Judas Priest hired Dave Holland. Yeah, yeah. Well, for, we could do a whole I mean, episode on that. That's yeah. It worked for them. Well, you know, he's fine for what he does, but it's like, but but they're yeah. you know as heavy as they got in in the early '80s. You know, on a couple of those albums, it's like you would have thought they waited till Painkiller to bring the guy in that should have been the guy. Right. Right? But you know what, though, and this is one of the things in hindsight. So I didn't know anything about Trapeze. What in the Growing up with priests, he was and everything. fine with trapeze. That's where that's where I'm going with this. Is I know Dave Holland as being the human drum machine and Judas Priest who did nothing. And then you go back and you listen to the trapeze records. You're like, wait a minute, that's Dave Holland too. It's like, why, why, what happened to that guy? So I, I think, think he was, was told specifically yes. what you're going to be doing. Yeah. I think that Les you're Binks right. was still my my favorite <clears throat> drummer, Priest, yeah. without a doubt. Les Binks. I think that they were like, okay, we don't need somebody busy. We had him. We just need you just to lock down and just give us a beat here and let us do our thing. And you just keep it simple because I mean, yeah. it depended on the song, like some of the slower, like, it, I don't know, like you listen to electric eye, his style, it, it's fine. You know, it kind of works right on the wind. It works. It's it only works. when it gets really fast. Like I always thought like the song ram it down. Like when it's, it's almost like proto painkiller. It's like, yeah, but didn't they use a drum, a drum machine on that? It sounds like a drum machine. If it's a drum I, I think they did. <laughs> I think they did use a machine on they that. I, th I thought they did. I thought it was in one of the uh, one no, of the I books. Because it sounds like a fucking drum machine. If it's a real yeah. drummer, like man, they they studioed the fuck out of him to make it sound artificial. But you know who who knows if it was real or him or not. But yeah. But think about think about what what riding on the wind and and uh, the screaming for vengeance record. What that would have sounded like with Les Bings on drums. It would have been better. It would have been definitely yeah. better. Yeah. Or the yeah, Dave Hollands who played some serious shit on Medusa, trapeze. or you yeah. are the music, we're just the band. Those are yep. great trapeze albums. Right. He's amazing right. on those. Yep, he is amazing on those. Yeah, hundred percent. Crazy. Yep. I'll give you an example though. The the biggest thing is that, and Pete, you probably know these guys. The old '70s band Dust from the early '70s. Oh yeah, yeah. Like 
they had the drummer was Mark Bell, and he had this great, intricate, busy style, real good stuff. And then that's Marky Ramone from the fucking Ramones. You would not know it's the same guy. It's I, I didn't even realize either. And I had the Dust albums and Ramones albums for years. And my friend Craig is like, Mark Bell, that's Marky Ramone. And it's like a little light bulb. <laughs> like, yeah. no fucking way. It doesn't sound at all alike. It's like intricate, like, you know, proggy kind of like hard rock. And like, obviously, like the Godfather's a punk rock, which is totally different. Mm. But yeah. yeah, sometimes drummers can fool you. But more power to them if they can do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, Dave, you want to join our band that's starting to get big? Just do what we tell you. Okay. And you'll get a nice paycheck. <laughs> Play this beat, we'll pay it. Yeah. All right. Keep your mouth shut and just <laughs> yeah, just keep, it, keep it simple, stupid. And that was the story why Les Banks was out. There was some kind of payment he was he was got screwed out of, and it wasn't a ton of money. Uh, I think it was for uh, Unleashed, in Unleashed in the East, and yeah. they were like, "Okay, that's it. You're done. We'll get somebody yeah, no. else." You want me? To, I'll tell you exactly why Les Banks isn't in Judas Priest. He got kicked out of Judas Priest. Look on the back of Unleashed in the East. And he's wearing, no, is it unle Unleashed? No, is this thing class? Or Hell Bent? Hell Bent, where he's got the kimono on. <laughs> that's why he got, that's why he's not in Judas Priest anymore. Yeah, but all like, those. You're wearing a kimono for your photo shoot, dude? <laughs> <coughs> yeah, but back then, they all look fucking weird. I mean, there's footage of, of, uh, How are you wearing a kimono on the, on stage? Yeah, uh, on the stained class tour. And I think, I'm not sure if Halford is wearing a kimono or his mom's dress. He's got like, like he's, a red kimono. Yeah, he's on there like a fucking red, red thing <laughs> doing his thing. It's like Jesus, you know. I don't know what it was. He said he said he went to lessons. So I told you I'm the guy that wears a kimono. Yeah, you can't wear one. That thank, was it. thank God he Listen. found the the fucking the the gay S and M leather shops, and 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 did you know had a shopping spree there because who knows if they would have survived you know doing that stuff. And what would metal be now if he, if he didn't do that? Hundred percent. I'm gonna say Rob Halford can wear whatever the fuck he wants on stage. Yes, he can. <laughs> You're wearing a real long dress that can get caught in the chain of your Harley and tear you right <laughs> yeah, off. That that good so point. Well, right? That's a good point. I, I, I always they, said Judas Judas Priest and the Ramones should have had like, you know, uh, life lifetime memberships at like fucking Wilson's Leather. Like I don't know which band sold more leather jackets, do. but maybe they do. You know. Yeah. <laughs> I think Priest changed those all the time. The Ramones wore the same ones. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> oh, geez. Rob Halford must change, you know, 16 times in one concert. Yeah. yeah. Joey Ramone didn't change once in 25 no. years. Ah, kept it no, that's true. And good for him. Too. <laughs> All right, Butch, you're number two. Iconic album cover. One of the, one of two shows that my mother would not let me go to. Oof. Um, cause my Ooh. grades weren't up to par and I was really, really upset. The next day I came to school and everyone's t-shirt had that logo on it. The old baseball shirts with the three quarter sleeves. Yep. And I had friends wearing that. I was so fucking mad. And that was with cozy in 1981. And I only saw cozy once and it was many years after that. Um, but I was really upset that I did not get the, and, and honestly, I didn't get to see Shanker. It, I, I discovered Michael Shanker in 1979 when I was 12 and I didn't see him until 89. So if my mom had let me go to that show, I would have seen Cozy and Shanker and I would have been really, really happy. Um, but yeah, I love this album. I mean, just, just the intro to looking for love. Cozy is just cozy. He's bashing. He's got that charisma to his, his playing. Like I said, there's, there's, there's drummers, and then there's drummers that you hear that make you want to play drums and have a groove to them, and it's and it's instantly identifiable that it's them, and that's what Cozy was always to me, is that no matter what he played on, the, you hear a fill, and it's and it just makes you want to do the little things that he does, and God damn, I, I love that record. That that's 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 my second favorite Michael Shanker record behind the Salt Attack, and. And uh, yeah, I, re I really wish that they could have done more. I would have loved to see Cozy and Chris Glenn. I love Chris Glenn as a bass player. Yeah, yeah. It would have been awesome to see Chris and, and Cozy do a couple more records together, man. Yep, I agree. Good rhythm section. Yes, sir. All right, my number one and two, God, are like neck and neck, but my number one's got to be my number one. So my number two has got to be slided in. Uh, I 100% agree with Butch. You know, the UK version of this album is good. Mm. The US version is phenomenal. 
there's just something ballsy about it. The production's great. This is probably my favorite Martin Birch production right here. Mm. Love the production on this album. Wow. Coverdale sounds amazing. Cozy sounds amazing. Uh, Sykes and Mel Galley. And there's another thing. I would have loved to have heard these two guys do more together. I mean, one of the worst strokes of luck in the history of hard rock and metal is what happened to Mel Galley around this time period. He basically co-writes this entire album, plays some killer riffs on this album, and then hurts himself. And basically his career is done for the most part. Well, at least in this band, he did the Phenomena thing a couple of years yeah. later. But man, he just missed out on all of this. But again, something's happened for a reason because John Sykes became the man because of that, right? So uh, yeah, I mean, this there's not a bad song on this album. And uh, I agree, you know, maybe Cozy doesn't stand out as much on this album but i think that's a testament to all the guys that are on it you know you got john lord on here and neil murray i mean this is like to me perhaps the strongest white snake lineup ever but like i said before i still remember the first time i heard slow and easy on the radio and you hear him blasting away and i'm like that's got to be cozy powell right and then you see the video and there he is you're like oh this is this is something else so yeah <laughs> Slide it in is my number two. Here we go to number one, Mr. Allo, back to you. Okay, yeah, my number one. Uh, I definitely agree with uh, everything you just said and whatever uh, Butch said previously about uh, slide it in, you know, the uh, US mix sounding better than the uh, UK mix. As a kid, I had the tape. Uh, this is the, uh, the British CD that I picked up in England when I saw Sabbath in 92. Uh, this is the 25th anniversary double disc which is basically the US version and then most of the UK version and a DVD. And then this is the somewhat recent uh, seven disc slide it in uh, box yeah, set. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's my my favorite Whitesnake album by far, my favorite Whitesnake lineup. And uh, yeah, I just, uh, every song is amazing. I wish I could have seen this lineup uh, back in 84 and in some, you know, multiverse, alternate universe. There is a version of Cozy Powell and David Coverdale that do join Geezer Butler and Tony Iommi because there was apparently some some talks at some point of because uh, uh, Cozy had talked to Tony in the '80s about coming over uh, to Sabbath, and there was some kind of talk uh, before Slide It In that maybe uh, uh, Coverdale would join, and I think that would be a a weird but awesome combination and i'd, I'd pay i'd pay big money to see that so Why who not, knows? some alternate universe so what if weird alternate universe that would be cool but yeah this is my my favorite record that uh that cozy uh plays on without my uh do i mention any honorable mentions or, or now we're oh we'll we'll circle back around oh, okay, yeah. yeah and just a little word to our british friends because i know it's going to come up in the comments uh you gotta understand <laughs> here here in the states white snake were like i said a non-entity until that album so i yeah. know they were somewhat of a big deal over in the uk oh, sure. yeah. and those early albums are great i absolutely you know love them uh but people here in the states slide it in and the white snake album is what made them huge in this country so most people that's why when you talk about us americans and white snake we kind of gravitate towards those two but all the albums prior are great i love the bluesy albums and uh, ready and willing yeah, yeah, ready and willing, come and get it. I mean, you know, that yeah. song "Ready and Win" is probably is in my top three songs of White Snake period. Oh, it's killer! I love that song. Absolutely killer. Yeah, I mean, it, I always thought it was so ironic that White Snake and and Scorpions had such similar careers because they, you know, until they cracked in America, they were relatively unknown, and then when they cracked, all their back catalogs got you know re released or released finally in the states. Yeah, and I, I was. Just, just thought it was so interesting that their their careers really were similar. And then today they announced a tour together, which they had done together in I saw them Scorpions, White Snake, and Docket in like, I don't know, like 2003, I think, or four. It was a long time ago, but they did it once before. Yeah, because uh back then, you know, until Slide It In and Blackout came out, you really couldn't find a lot of the their either albums, no. the older ones you know, in here in the record bins and stuff, unless you saw, you know, had a good import section to, uh, right. To. So cool. All right. So, uh, Chris Cantonary, what do you got? All right. I'm going with actually the third force field album. <laughs> Not nice. 
Um, yeah, I'm going with rising. Um, like I said before, you know, it could be one, two, or three, but today, number one, killer album. I mean, the intro to Stargazer is freaking legendary. And uh, there's not a whole lot I can say that hasn't been said a million times by almost everybody on this channel. You know, it's it's an all time balls out classic album. Um, I did see some guy comment the other day that he thought side one was weak. I don't remember who it was, but wrong. You know, go to hell, asshole, whoever wrong. you are. Um, it's 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 killer from start to finish. Classic album, you know. Rainbow Rising, number one. Yeah, a lot of people talk about how side one is like. Huh? A lot of people talk about how side one is not as great as side two, and yeah, but it doesn't mean that it sucks. I don't think anyway. Right, no. it blew me away as a kid. I mean, I had uh, uh, the first album, Blackmore's Rainbow, or whatever you want to call it, and I was pretty familiar with it. And then I got Rising you know, probably a few months later, and I was like, whoa, this is different. You know, and I think it really it was another level and another gear that Cozy helped them get into after the first album. So it blew me away. And I mean, Terrell Woman was the first song I heard off of that. And I still, I think it's a killer track. So Terrell Woman is great. Well, I think, I think most people seem to, who, who have that opinion, seem to have a problem with Starstruck and Do You Close Your Eyes. Fuck you. Good right? Good song. But they are good songs, right? Tracks. Yeah. Who doesn't like fucking Starstruck? God damn it! Don't piss me off talking about Cozy like that now. Come on. People with shitty taste gotta be. Jesus sick. Christ. Yeah. So I don't know. More on that in a few the, minutes. The third Force Field album kills, guys. <laughs> Rushes. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> fucking. Oh, oh, that was phenomenon too. Is Cozy Powell on that? Uh, I, I think listened played, to it a yeah, but years. he doesn't play as much. I don't because I think that album's got a lot of guys on it. So. Yeah, I remember. I know it's got Ray Gillen on on like one yeah, track, yeah. who sounds great on it, by the way. Yeah, yeah. But now the first phenomena is is the best by far. But there's, there's enough to recommend on the second. The third one is okay. Yeah. All right, Ryan, you're number one. Uh, it's gonna be Rising. And uh, well, first off, the intro to Tower of Woman when it opens up with that synth for like a minute. And then the guitar starts to come in and then Cozy comes in. Come on, that's, that's one of the best intros ever, ever for any album. It's absolutely 10 out of 10 out of 10. But uh, yeah, it's hard to say anything about this album that hasn't been said. So to me, I, I just kind of like touch on what I said a minute ago, you know, transitioning from hard rock to metal. Uh, 19, this is 1976. So this is right at the fucking cusp of it. To me, there's two albums that basically led the charge. One's Rising and one's Savings of Destiny. Savings of Destiny is fucking great. But that drumming was done by Alan Moore. It's a good album. He's a very competent drummer, but the drum sound is kind of like, you know, it's just, it's whatever. You know, it gets the job done. It gets the job done for the album, and the album is great. But Rising, with, obviously now you got Martin Birch, so way the drums come thundering in on Tower Woman, whole different fucking sack of potatoes, way better. Uh, it's just, it's a monstrous album. Uh, I don't really know what else to say about it. Hands down, my favorite Rainbow. Uh, arguably kicked off speed metal, power metal, all these genres that would come along later in the 80s that blew up. Uh, they all owe a huge debt of gratitude to Rainbow. If Rainbow didn't exist, they wouldn't exist or they would sound different. So they owe a huge debt of gratitude to Cozy for kicking that style off drum-wise. So, you know, not only is it an awesome album, but it's one of those albums where if you deleted that, a lot of shit that comes later that people love would uh, be a lot different or might not exist at all. It's just one of those exactly. uh, monumental albums that's so, uh, you know, what else can be said about it? And the artwork is fucking great too. You know, that's one of the most iconic covers. As soon as you see that, you're like Ken Kelly, you know, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. Kelly artwork. So who did uh, the Man War records? Yep, that's true. But and Rising's probably to me, it's probably his coolest cover. It's just that kind of iconic. So, uh, yeah. oh, I'm going with Rising. And uh, yeah, obviously side two is great, but every there's not there's not a weak song on that album. I don't care who says what. Every song yep. is fucking great. Agreed. Yeah. Stargazer all day, but every song is great. Yep. G Butch, I wonder what your number one is. <laughs> Could not possibly guess. <laughs> so, like Ryan just said, and I was, you know, you, you kind of threw the words out of my mouth when I was thinking about Tara Woman. It's like if the if if Stargazer wasn't on this album with that intro, people would talk about Tara Woman. Oh yeah, yeah. Because that intro, like you said, to me, that that is just 
is every like I start smiling as I start to talk about is everything that I love about Cozy that I've been trying to get across through this. That's that intro too. It, it starts to and it's like you can see Cozy. It's just you hear that intro and you cannot play air drums as you hear it. You, have you to. can't. You have to play. That's that is quintessential Cozy Powell. And like you said, that's 1976. And like I had, I had mentioned about the Bedlam album from 73. If, you, if you've never heard this record, do yourself a favor and listen to this record because it's the precursor to Rising and you'll hear where it all came from. Yeah, go get this little box set if it's still available because it's got that album. It's got uh, some studio stuff, unreleased studio stuff and a live CD. It's well worth having. Great early 70s heavy rock and it's the emergence of the heavy hitting Cozy Powell for sure. Just just killing it. Like, I like all you guys have already said and uh, I'll leave something for Pete now too. <laughs> it's just, yeah. It's no a mystery, right? Record. No mystery here, right? The two weeks in a yeah. row. It's, I it's feel like we've record. talked we've talked about Rainbow Rising more in the last week than uh, well we talk about Rainbow Rising a lot on this channel. You're well, absolutely right. Everybody's right now. Yeah, I mean, uh, to me, I love this record. It's one of my favorite albums of all time. But I will say this is also to me Cozy Powell's best performance on any album. I think studio record anyway. Uh, he's just he's amazing on here. This this album is not as incredible if you take him out of the equation. It's still great, but he is like. And it's this lineup, man. I mean, these guys together work magic. And Richie, I love you, but man, you're a dick for breaking this lineup up. I mean, <laughs> as great as Long Live Rock and Roll is, if you would have kept this lineup together for a couple more albums, Rainbow would have been on top of the world, right? I just, you know, I, I remember like reading interviews and stuff from him back then and how he, he got frustrated with playing this style of music and he wanted all this success for Rainbow and he wanted to be a big band and he got enamored with Foreign. He's like, oh, I wanted, we could do that. We're going to do that and be huge. And they did okay, but probably not as successful as they could have been or that he wanted. Keep this lineup together and do another album like, like, like this and Long Live Rock and Roll and maybe Rainbow would have become that huge band like he wanted but anyway I digress. but then uh, we wouldn't have had heaven on hell mob rules you, you so. i know this you, whole you, what if thing. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah let's you not let's not go back in time and, and change that yeah you take the good you take the bad you take them you know how it goes yeah, yeah that's true um yeah and listen, happens, i got happens. really big with joe lynn turner i mean rainbow was doing if i'm not mistaken in 82 they did two nights at madison square garden i mean that's fucking unbelievable yeah. unbelievable yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I yeah, it was definitely foreigner territory. It was Stone Cold was huge then. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, I mean, and I love all the songs on here. Man, side to Stargazer and Light in the Black. <sighs> Just... And how crazy is they never did Light in the Black live back then? Makes no sense. Yeah, great song. Great fucking song. Yeah. So you know, another thing that doesn't make any sense. You listen to any like um, what's the name of the on, Rainbow on stage? Any of those live albums where they do Stargazer? Cozy doesn't do the intro. Yeah, right. I don't. I've never understood that. Why would you not play that intro? It's it's part of the because I mean, Richie Blackmore needed like, another guitar ah, solo in that set. Yeah. <laughs> Cozy, no showing off. Now you oh, know. Oh, oh. And one more. Hold on, mate. One more it's guitar quick. solo. <laughs> it's only a couple seconds. I mean, it's not asking a lot here, you know. Exactly. Oh, Ronnie, you stay back there. Stay backstage. I need one more guitar solo. Hold on. You can keep backing up. You got hire Dave Holland. <laughs> you got who knows how to fucking behave. <laughs> he knows when to shut up and <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Dave Holland hears that intro to Stargate. He's like, oh yeah, no, I ain't doing that. Yeah, I <laughs> not for me. <laughs> but, I mean, I always kind of thought, I don't I can't prove this, of course, but once they got rid of Dave and they brought in, you know, Travis for painkiller. What is the first? How does Painkiller open up? He's like, let me open up my double bass drum because I'm intro. Man. Dave Holland would well, know what to do with a double kick pedal if he saw one. So, but that's you know, of, but that was when Priest. That's when Priest started to. We got to try to keep up with all the kids now. No, yeah. That's true. It, it, it works. It's intro to Painkiller, like the way that song starts off with the drums. I'm like, ah, eh, it always seemed kind of like a fuck you to Dave Holland the way he kicks it off, you know. It, it reclaim it, it reclaimed them yeah. the metal throne right off the gate. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I just, I mean, every time Priest tours, it seems like they do the most amount of material from Painkiller. And I've I've interviewed Judas Priest more than any other band, 
every time they come out and do a record, they're always comparing themselves to Painkiller. They always want another Painkiller because, yeah, that made them relevant again, and it was it was a huge hit, both you know critically and commercially. Yeah, and people still talk about it a lot. That's it. People still talk about it to this day. Yeah, it's still a big deal. All right, you want to, uh, Chris? You want to do some? uh, Yeah, the one that I, I mean, I knew everybody was going to talk about uh, "Long Live Rock and Roll." The one that I completely forgot about, and I love the record. We were was just talking about Grand Bonnet, "Down to Earth." Man, I fucking love that record. And um, Hollywood. Yeah, I mean, that's just a great, great record. Again, very different from the, the Dio era of, of Rainbow. But man, I think that's such a solid record. Um, and yeah, that was that was the one that I was like, oh, shit, I totally forgot that. But I wanted to play by the rules. Unlike my colleagues, I don't want to have any, you know, six way ties. So I'm like, no, nope, I'm sticking with five. It's my guy. I have to. <laughs> And yeah, Forbidden sucks, but if you're going to listen to Forbidden, I do like the Forbidden uh, rough mix better. It still sucks, but it's it's rougher, so it sounds better. <laughs> and all these bootlegs, all these Cozy Powell bootlegs came apparently when he passed away. Of course. Um, his girlfriend, like, sold the tapes to Japan. It's to some bootlegger in Japan. And on the back, they even have pictures of the actual cassettes from um oh, wow. from uh cozy pals collection um so it, you know it's kind of weird but kind of cool that they, they came out because i do like weird hearing you know weird unreleased bootleg stuff so mm. wow cool all right cans what do you got uh my for honorables yeah well the, the second force field album pretty pretty strong <laughs> uh, i'm gonna what, check out those records been- I'll go get him. Talk to you to it. One thing I want to mention, I don't know who this guy is, and I'm not doing this because I know him or whatever, but if you do Instagram, there's this guy named, or the, I don't even know what they call it, but there's an account. It's called G-Force Club, and it's nothing but rare pictures of, like, Schenker, uh, John Norum, uh, George Lynch, Gary Moore, you know, guys we talk about all the time, and it's all this rare photography from that, like, realm. So... Check it out, like Butch. I thought it was you. I'm like, that's gotta be Butch. <laughs> but I mean, it's like, it's cool, you know. So, I'm not paying me to say this, or I don't even know who the hell the guy is. But if you do Instagram, something to check out. Are they his own pictures, or are they just like stuff he's? It's, it's very mysterious, you know. They, they just show <laughs> up on credit or whatever. But um, you know, here's one from today. You know, John Sykes. John Sykes. <laughs> John Sykes, but it, it's all stuff like this all the 1984. time. 1984. So you guys would enjoy if you if you're into that. I would so. very much enjoy that. Yeah. I was G-Force. expecting something on Battle of the Planets when he said G Force. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Okay, I used to love that cartoon. I like Seven Zark Seven. That's cool. Science Science Ninja Team Gachaman. Nice. <laughs> all right, Ryan, what do you got left? Uh, yeah, so earlier on, my brain totally split in half. Uh, the first, obviously, the first Michael Schenker was Michael Schenker Group with Simon Phillips, and then obviously MSG. And my brain's like, it's not fucking working for a second. So uh, the MSG album because it's fucking great, and uh, that none of my uh, neurons are fucking firing again here. Uh, in your defense, that is a terrible title for a second record. Yeah, right? totally. First record is Michael Schenker work. Group. Your second record is MSG. Forty fucking years later, it fucked me up. I'm like, ah, oh, no shit. So yeah, so and that's as bad as Trouble coming out with a record called Trouble, and then like ten years later coming out with another record called Trouble. Can't be doing that. Well, Led Zeppelin just kept doing Led Zeppelin, Led Zeppelin. You know, yeah. uh, you know, people people figuring it out. I don't have a problem with that, but yeah. So yeah, MSG definitely because that's a great fucking album, and uh, that of my brain's working again. Here we go. Yeah. All right, Butch. Well, the one that I, I would have loved to have got in, because you know, you guys, Chris was talking about, he saw Cozy five times. I met Cozy once the night before they played at the mid Civic Center in Poughkeepsie, the opening night of that tour, of uh, the Headless Cross tour, but I did not go to the show. Because um, I didn't like, even though I loved Cozy, I wasn't into that Sabbath. I hated it then. I'm like, don't call it Sabbath, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I did see him 
and now I don't have the, I'm trying to think of what you, I want to say it was 86, maybe, with Emerson Lake and Powell. Uh, oh, right, yeah. Uh, so Ooh. I did see that, and uh, ironically, Ingve Malmsteen opened up I was going to say, show. right, was that at Nassau Coliseum? Because I almost went to that one. I saw him at the Meadowlands in New Jersey. Okay, yeah, but and, I remember and, that tour. And, and on the ticket, it does say quadraphonic sound. So they were doing like the Pink Floyd thing where Interesting. it's behind you. Um, and, and it was awesome to see Cozy doing all the Carl Palmer stuff, bashing being Cozy and doing his metal stuff and this, and this prog rock, Emerson Lake and Powell thing. It was awesome. So I, I do love that record. Um, it's very, again, 80s, tons and tons of reverb. It sounds like he did his drums in an aircraft carrier. It It's enormous sounding but i like the old cozy tight tone um but that's a great record if, if you guys if people haven't heard it check that record at emerson lake and powell it is really cool um but another record that is the only record i like from this band at the time i don't think that i knew that cozy played on it um he's not credited on it as the drummer i think he's thanked in the special thanks uh, I am not a fan of the band Cinderella, but I I, I always have loved this album, Long Cold Winter. It, oh, yeah, is the, it is not a Cinderella sounding record. It is a blue, it's just a hard rock blues record. And Cozy plays on that, the whole record. And it's great. Um, so I would definitely recommend that. It's, it's not, like I said, it's not the early big hair Cinderella. It's a different stripped down kind of thing. It's, it actually is a really, really good record. Um, and then obviously for me, the other two, well, the, the, the early two, um, second and third cozy solo albums, Tilt and Octopus. Um, Gary Moore's on them, Clem is on it again. There's a lot of great big people, Don Airy. Um, just those records are just tremendous and it's cozy it, being able to be cozy and focus the drums up front and uh just some great stuff yeah i'll, I'll echo those uh the cozy albums are really good they're just great fusion albums right it's give him a chance to do something a little bit different and it's they're pretty pretty cool lots of great guest stars on there yeah so i would echo that um <clears throat> the bedlam is on my honorable mentions i think you know if, like i said i didn't want to repeat bands but uh I absolutely love uh, Tear. I absolutely love Long Live Rock and Roll and Down to Earth. You know, we didn't really talk about a lot about Down to Earth today, but that's also a really good cozy album, I think. That, that's kind of like a transition album for the band, but uh, Cozy's mm. great on that. He would leave right after that. And uh, yeah, I mean, that uh, that kind of... And I like I like Facing the Animal, too. I think that's a really good Ingve album. Yeah. Like one of the, you know, that Chris, that was before he did the two albums with Ripper, right? The two that was that's yes, right. uh, because if I remember right, Facing the Animal came out late '97, and the tour was early '98, and then uh, Cozy had his uh, whatever accident that prevented him from doing the tour, and then shortly after was his his car accident. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the Ripper records were a couple years later. Yeah, like early two thousand. Yeah. Because I think first Ripper was in Ice Earth, Earth. Yeah. In like two thousand three, maybe. 2003 yeah i think and then and then ripper was in ingve right after that i think yeah all right <laughs> so we got, we got a special guest to come in and give his picks as well mr chris caffrey this is going to take an hour and a half hold on a second i'm getting things going here all right here there i am i made it what's going on dude i'm sorry i fucked up i forgot to send you the because now i have my i have my favorite cozy pal record is the zoomless chris <laughs> but Chris, what are your favorite uh, Cozy Powell albums? Instead of the Headless Cross, we have the Zoomless Chris. That would be the, or the Squareless <laughs> Chris. The Squareless Chris, I think, is even better. I think that's better. So now it was it was my mom's 80th birthday, and then I, I thought, for some reason, I, I think part I'm not um keeler does some of his stuff at nine sometimes so i was like i got till nine and then i'm like th looking around i'm like there's nothing then i started seeing some of my friends were said they were they were at the malmstein show and i talked to phil x on thursday and he told me that was canceled so i didn't try to get to that but i don't know if he was playing if there was if he did there's probably like six people there because that's what ryan was just saying about an hour ago yeah there's nobody there 
Oh, so he did play? Yeah. I heard he played, yeah. Some people went. Hmm. So, because well, I texted Phil X on Thursday and I said, well, Are you going to be in Sugarloaf on Monday? And he said, That show got canceled. So that's why I didn't even make an attempt to go down there. So, but who knows? Anyway, I mean, it's pretty obvious that I'm going to have those Sabbath records just because those Sabbath records are two of my favorite records ever. I mean, um, there's so many great records. It's really hard to pick. I, I, when I was thinking about this, I'm like, Jesus Christ, how do you pick three? You know, and, and obviously the rainbow ones you know and, and the white snake ones and the shanker ones and it's just it's really hard for me to pick three there's even some stuff that um i don't know if it got released on record or was just recordings you can hear him john west did some stuff with him too the very end some some uh cozy powell recordings under his name there's some stuff there's um there's a ballad and some other stuff you can find it online so i mean he was just a great drummer you you watch the uh the rainbow live DVD and oh, Germany. It's, yeah. just a, it's just a badass drumming performance. I mean, he just, he was that, you know, he was that guy. He had that, you know, the finesse in his playing, but he beat the shit out of his drums. So it was like, he had that, you know, hard ass drummer style that I think was a lot of the style of, of many of the drummers back there. But, you know, people always talked about Bonham and how he, uh, he um you know was was his hitting, but Cozy was he was a he was a basher when it came to his his attack on those drums. So it's really like I said, it's real hard for me to pick three records. But those two Sabbath records happen to be like two of my favorite records ever. I just I mean Tier Two, which it's one of those ones that kind of falls you know off the radar a lot of times, which I just don't understand why. Because maybe it's, that's why a lot of times I think people don't love a lot of the music that I write because I'm like well a lot of it's a lot like that so obviously there's something in that that goes I either it just you know and there's not enough strippers that could dance to it or it's not commercial enough I don't know what it is about that record it's just it's I think it's just a real true metal kind of a record and I, I think the true metal fans really really like it but a lot of people we people, gave it some love like, while you were before you got here we gave it some love huh we gave Tear some love before you came in. And that's cool. I missed what you guys gave love to. So I was just telling you that it could be just about anything with this guy. <laughs> you know, I was looking through the list and saw some things that I didn't even have. And I was like, I, for, I didn't even realize he was on some of these things. But it's just, there's too much for me to name three. You know, he was he was awesome. Yeah, I think what we did, covered... What, the... what did you guys pick? What was the most popular? Well, Rising. Uh, rising. Rising. Uh, course, yeah. Both Headless Cross and Tear from Sabbath, obviously. Okay. Uh, okay. Long Live I'm Rock. Right there with you. Long Live Which Rock one? and Roll. Yeah. Uh, slide It In. Yeah, obviously. Like MSG. Yeah, that was my other one. And then uh, we also mentioned Phenomena. We also mentioned, what else did we? Bed uh, yeah. Jeff Begg, Rough and Ready. Field. Yeah, he had something. I mean, that Jeff Beck record, too. I mean, there's just a lot of great shit that he did, man. He, 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 he was there with everybody you know he had a lot of friends everybody loved him and whenever he could play that you know people wanted to go to him he was he was like the go-to guy for a long time with a lot of those it was with a lot of the english musicians especially that he was their uh he was their guy you know and west i mean he he started working with him and uh he he was really close with cozy because he was using him him for like cozy powell's solo stuff his own stuff so there is songs that you could find with john west and cozy powell they're they're out there you can find them but i don't think anything was ever officially released as a uh, a record to buy but they're there there's mixed versions of songs on on youtube you could find power of the internet yeah, that's right that's right so Cool. There you have it, everybody. Some lots of love for Cozy Powell. And uh, I want to thank everybody for, uh, you know, kind of coming and talking a little bit about this great drummer that we all miss so much. So uh, this was lots of fun. So thanks for Mr. Caffrey for coming on at the last minute again. Well, I, I think I brought this to one more person than the Malmsteen show. <laughs> <laughs> and what I know, I think five people went there. Now you're at six. So you got one more than the Malmsteen show right now, I guess. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I think tomorrow I'm going to go up and um, into Connecticut and see those uh, Burning Witches girls. Burning Witches, yeah. Because uh, they, uh, I played 
Paul the Mountain King on their record, their bonus track. And um, I was thinking of going down there. I don't know if they're going to have me go on stage and play it, but if they do, it's, I a, great, it's a great theater. Is it? Yeah, though, I, I checked it out to see because that's one of the ones they're not doing that with um, the Iron Maidens. I think it's right, just because I, I saw the Iron Maidens at that same theater in Norwalk like a month ago. Yeah, so this is just them, and I think they they had a decent ticket sale for. I was looking online for for Tuesday, so I'm gonna. I, I don't know exactly what the plan is, but I'm gonna probably head down and see them tomorrow. So, nice yeah, I sense. wanted to go see Malmsteen, and I wanted to hang out with Phil, and he's like, "It's canceled." I'm like, "All right." Hmm. Right around the corner for you. Right? <laughs> Quick little drive. Maybe they canceled Phil X. Maybe Phil X was canceled. Maybe oh. Phil wasn't there. It was just oh. Inga and his amps. More money for Inga. Yeah. <laughs> all marshals all the time. That's exactly. right. Well, if anybody's watching uh, and you've actually went to the Ingve show in Sugarloaf, let us know in the comments below how that went. So, uh, maybe there's maybe one was person. Than people I know just went I could to still, it. I could still get there. It's 9.31. I'm only yeah. 10 Yeah, minutes you can away. do it, Chris. Yeah, because right. you know, Ingve will play I two hours. The, I could take the pajamas off and head over there. <laughs> there you go. He's yeah. still soloing. <laughs> That, he's yeah. still, exactly, he's still yeah. soloing. So, yeah, yes, he is. Yes, he is. I was watching some of the stuff from M3, and he's still soloing, but it don't sound. Yeah, I think I said this description to some bands before. You know, like when you watch Pet Cemetery, and the cat comes back from all of the dead, and it's it's the cat, but it's not the cat. You know, it's like Ingve's healthier now, and he seems like you know he's he's lost a lot of weight and stuff. But Ingve Live is like to me the the cat and pet cemetery <laughs> it's just not you know i saw him in alcatraz and on rising force and with joel and turner and it was like your jaw was on the floor and now it's just like yeah i don't even know if i want to go see it now but i, I love him he's a great guitar player I, he played better than i'll ever play in my life even when he plays bad but you know <laughs> it's yeah. like that's that's all I got to say. I don't know. If I want to, I, I I don't know we if I all kind of said the same thing tonight. We're like, yeah. I don't know if I want to go see the the cat from Pet Cemetery in Sugar Bowl, but maybe. <laughs> oh, geez. All right, everybody. That's a wrap. Thanks for watching. Visit us on the web at www.catranquility.org. Check us out on Facebook and come back each and every day here on YouTube for Chris Caffrey, Chris Sallow, Chris Canzanari. We got Chris's are wild tonight. Ryan Scout, Butch <laughs> Jones, I am Pete Pardo. Good night, everybody. See you next Monday here on the Hudson Valley Squares. Take care.